my car burned. Yeah, I recorded that one. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just saying. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> All right. I got it. <laughs> Waited for weeks for that. David's hello. He has graced me with it once again. All right. Uh, you can turn to Acts 5. This is the last time we'll be in it for quite some time. Uh, I did say last week that we were going to be taking a much more practical look at evangelism. And we and there there will be some practic practical information uh, in here, I think. But uh, I really wanted to, and I, I teased you guys the first week with uh, five points. So we're going to finish the five points. Uh, they're really, it's really important to uh, establish this foundation. So I think it's uh, important that we conclude the last three points here rather than move on just to, uh, for the sake of having a more practical sermon. Uh, I might have just kind of misspoke as the popular phrase goes uh, today. So, um, unknown perhaps to Israel, nearing the end of their country, um, and as their history books would be, it become nearer to a close before they were overrun, it must have felt much like it does today in America. Because for years we've enjoyed our own our own country, uh, we seem to experience what it seemed like the sovereign hand of God blessing us, right, and growing us in ways that God and uh, many other nations have quite literally only dreamed of. The reality of this fact, and it is a fact that um, evidenced by the simple notion, we dub our way of life, right called the American Dream. By and large, this is how the world one time used to look at us. Land of the free, home of the brave. But over the last 50 years or so, it seems, and some would argue longer, uh, they may have a valid point, <clears throat> there's been a stirring in the country. Uh, the stirring seems to be rapidly changing our nation. This is not a political message you will see, but uh, we're just gonna start off here. <clears throat> so it may feels like there's an enemy among us, like something has crept in unaware and, just, and is destroying us from within. And to a large degree, this does seem to be the very case. And there is no shortage of opinions on how we should go about to change uh, this, what can be done. And in Israel, by the end of David's rule, Israel's first really good king. David was handing the key, the keys to the kingdom to his son Solomon, uh, who was a good king like his father. And Israel was experiencing peace. But he made a choice, and that choice by the near the end of his reign would begin the destruction and downfall over his 381 years uh, before Jerusalem was captured by Babylon and the whole of Israel and Judah were taken to Babylon, finally and completely. And for 350 years uh, before the final end, uh, they continued to slide into the abyss. Dozens of decades, multiple generations had passed. Uh, and just when they thought the wickedness couldn't get any worse, and this is where we're saying it kind of feels like now, Ju Josiah became the new king in Judah. And Josiah got rid of everything of idolatry. He got rid of all of the altars of worship, all the high places of praise and worship. He got rid of the, the male cult prostitutes from inside the temple. Imagine that. This is how bad things had become. And as they set out to repair the temple from all of this, Hilkiah, the father of Jeremiah, found the book of the law and he brought it before the king. And scripture tells us in 2 Kings 22, 11, that when the king heard the words that were written in the book, he tore his clothes. And that's an outward expression of his inside pain. He felt 
ripped in two, and he was convicted. The king knew that over the last 100 350 years, the Israel had sinned against God. And listen to what he says in verse 13 of that chapter. Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because of our fathers. Because our fathers, I'm sorry, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do all that is according to uh, to do according to all that is written concerning us. And we only wish, right? We only wish and pray daily that our leaders would do the same. And yet they don't. They do almost the opposite of that. Digging us even deeper into depravity. Many Christian groups have called for the nation to be repaired on many levels, desperately trying to save us from what feels like certain slow death. Singing feeling that our country today uh, must have been what they felt, the Israelites felt in that time. We wanna bring about change, but how do we do that? Can reform really work? Can we really save our country with more reforms to this nation? Even in Josiah's day, the only thing that they did was prolong it. That they saved themselves and the people of that time for about 30 years, they were able to prosper a little bit longer before God would bring the destruction. Why didn't the reform work? Because the hearts of the people hadn't changed. As soon as Josiah passed away, they went right back to putting the altars in the temple, bringing back the male cult prostitutes and idol worship. And God eradic finally eradicated idol worship from Israel once and for all. And the Jews from that day, as soon as Babylon was, or Jerusalem was taken and Israel went to Babylon, they never did again worship idols. And they had to learn a hard, hard lesson. And they returned from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem, but they would never again be their sovereign nation from 600 BC to about 1980 or 1948 AD, 2100 years, they would not be their own sovereign nation anymore. About 620 years after Josiah and the day of our Lord, Israel uh, was this time, uh, again, a kind of an informal nation, but they were under the, the ruling pressure of Rome, right? And uh, many, want, many wanted a king like David. They wanted him to come save them from Rome, make things right again. Many today look for uh, a man to do something like that. I'm not just talking about Trump. I mean, we, we would hope that anyone, DeSantis, anyone could be someone that would bring, uh, a qualified man to bring us uh, back from what looks like the abyss, right? We want real change. We don't want real reform. But is it what we need to do is just to drain the swamp? I think it may make things more comfortable. It may prolong things, but what are we really talking about here? We're talking about radical change on a deeper level than what you can do morally, lasting change. And if there was ever a time in history where one man could have done it, you'd think it would have been during Jesus' time. But even after Jesus' resurrection, before he ascended, still anticipating the kingdom, the disciples said to our Lord, is it at this time you're bringing the kingdom? Still misunderstanding the mission of Christ. And they would find out the answer to their question unsatisfactorily is no. And by that I mean Jesus was not taking or bringing swift revolution to Rome. But he did bring about change and shows us the way that it happens. Publicly, the ministry began on the day of Pentecost. Of course, we know it started before that. But 3,000 hearts were won over to Christ and the disciples would see the way in which God would choose to save the world and bring about lasting change in the world. And over the next 300 years, uh, each subsequent heart and soul would, would, would be won over to the Lord and they would begin to bring about that change that everyone had longed for for such a long time. And this is how we do it. 
eventually you know that Constantine, Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity and he made Christianity, which once was uh, the mur they used to murder Christians, now was the state religion. And it began to sweep over the entire world, right? So this is how it comes. If we want to bring about change in our country, our neighborhood, this is how we do it. Winning each heart to Christ. As many hearts as possible. We're going to see that in the text today. So as we look at these last few foundational elements, uh, we're going to have to focus on, on these parts to understand how critical it is to internalize how this works out. Uh, because it changes the way we look at evangelism. It changes how this works out and how it's placed and, he, and how when God places us where he places us in our lives, we can understand and internalize what our role is supposed to be and how we how that plays out in the particular spheres of influence that we might have. Right. So as we learn, we'll grow and we'll grow at new varying levels of progression and our basic understanding and skill levels will increase and we'll become greater, more useful tools uh, for God and his kingdom, right? So uh, it begins with this foundation, but let's go ahead and read. I'm not going to read. So the last two times we read Acts 1 or Acts 5, 1 through, I don't remember where we stopped, but we're going to start in verse 12 and just read for a few verses here. And we are going to make our way through the end of the chapter, but it's going to be, we're just going to kind of skip along. We're not going to read the whole thing in one shot and we're not going to read all the verses and their entirety is as well anyway. But let's start in verse 12. Uh, if you're looking at your pew Bible, it might be ver uh, page 95 or whatever. Verse 12, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. And this is a fancy way of saying though, the remains of Solomon's temple. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more the believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to such an extent that they were even carrying out the sick to the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were being healed. But the high priest rose up along all of his associates, this is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. We're just going to stop right there for now. And like I said, we're just going to try this a little differently, so we want to just kind of walk through the verses. And if you remember, the last points of our last two weeks, the first two points were this, the purity of the church, right? The first one, that's the most important part. You can't even think about evangelizing with anyone unless you're pure. In order to convince people that you have a message worth hearing, you have to show them the results. You must be free as much as it's humanly possible from sinfulness in your character. Because that only detracts from your message, right? Um, I think about a friend of mine who was sharing a post on gun control just the other day on Facebook. Uh, the, the guy that was speaking in the video I made a great argument. It was almost sound. Like you couldn't ar hardly argue against it. Um, but, but I noticed who the speaker was, and it was a man who I, I know that actually is abusive to his wife, and she had, actually had to leave him. And there's many, and he's a pastor. Um, and I had to, I told him as best I can without trying to you know, changing subjects that you look, if people start questioning this guy, they're going to look into his character. And they're going to see that he is a very, very sinful man. And that's going to destroy the credibility. There's, I mean, the arguments sound, other guys make it. You can find other guys to quote, try that. Uh, you know, just, you don't, people will find any reason they, they can to not believe your message. The last thing you want to do is walk up there with bad character and try to do that. Because people were looking, like I said, as they're trying to look for any reason to get away and not hear the message. And that has nothing to do with it, maybe. But we want to concede no ground then to the sinful mind of 
of the unbeliever who wants to isolate themselves from hearing God's word. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, or forsaking the gathering of God's people, that kind of thing. Uh, second, we preach a message that was the purity, right? So then we preach the second part is the power in the message is from God. The message itself is the words of God that, the, that gives life. And Jesus said to his disciples, you don't want to go away. And Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Remember, and that was after the people left Jesus in John 6, when he started speaking to them, no longer giving them the food they were looking for. So the message itself contains all the powers necessary about Christ to, to give you the message of God. And the message testifies of the Holy Spirit, of Christ's work, all the powers, all the miracles, and the testimony is in the words of God as we tell the world about the wonderful works of God. So as we look to stay on point, talk about the purity we talk about the power and the powers of the spirit no fancy arguments right no no slick ways of trying to convince someone sure we want to use our, our logic and our sense that god gave us to to form an argument that's that's decent but we're not trying to like snake oil salesmen trying to win someone over by changing the message a little bit power of those words is the witness of the Holy Spirit's testimony. So the third point then is uh, persecution. Because when you bring that message, as it happens out there in the world where you live, where you work, where you meet people and you talk to friends, it's going to bring persecution, right? The message you bring is going to bring persecution. Preaching this word in truth, no doubt, brings out. Look at verse 17. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates. That is the sect of the Sadducees. This is the same group of Sadducees that came to uh, Matthew 22 and tested him on the resurrection. They came after Jesus, and now they're coming after the apostles. And why are they coming after the apostles? Because he they healed people? Not at all because of the words they're preaching. They're preaching the words of Christ. They're preaching the message of Christ. And that brings persecution on them. And they're reminding them of their testimony that Jesus does live on. The very thing that they don't believe in resurrection. Remember, if they had the evidence to prove that Jesus was dead, still and this this group would be the first ones to put his body on display in public say he's really dead guys we got it this business about resurrection not true but they're not doing that and they can't and they would love nothing more than pretend to do that to produce that body so I remind you frequently about the cost of discipleship because this is what it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you persecution. Matthew 10. For anyone who thinks that the Christian life is going to make it your life easier. Do not think that I came to bring, came, came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I often refer to this. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And in case anyone thinks that Jesus can't obviously mean what, you, what it sounds like you're trying to say, uh, it, it means, he says this, a man's enemies will be the members of his household. It's pretty blunt, pretty to the point. Statements like that thin out the herd pretty fast. You won't really have people signing up for that program. No one wants to start evangelism if that's going to be the result. And you certainly don't hear that being preached from a lot of pulpits. I'm not saying this for a shock value. To be a fire and primzone hellfire preacher, uh, you know, obviously I'm not jumping up and down on the stage. I'm much more tame than that, but there's a point. 
crowds that line up to hear the message like this are much smaller than the crowds that want to go hear the other messages. Positive, the positivity. But we're here to grow true disciples of Christ. And you have to know that when you go out there in the world, you're going to be persecuted. It's going to come. It's going to rise from your own house. It's going to rise from your own children, from your own parents. It might come from your own cousins, your aunts, your uncles, or even your grandchildren. Even from your own friends. I talked to my brother yesterday about a friend of ours who we have known since 1992. He's, I preach to him all the time constantly and he's still willing to be my friend but he don't want to hear it and he isolates me in certain times because he doesn't want to hear what I have to say and that's fine we still are able to have fun in other ways but he knows where I stand so but you have to be willing to endure that kind of persecution you have to be able to will be willing to endure and tell your friends tell your relatives and look, there's a probably a high probability that they're going to make fun of you. There's a high probability they're going to reject you or reject your message. They may, and may even restrict access to other family members. I've told you guys before about how my mother was uh, restricted from seeing her own grandmother on her deathbed. Because she, my mother's aunt knew that she was going to tell her about Jesus and she did not want her to talk about Jesus and her grandmother's and her mother's last days so my mom was not even allowed to talk and that happens all the time uh, parents will keep grandchildren away from grandparents who want to share the gospel with each other with their kids especially when they really bring truth no one minds hey teaching their kids Jesus loves you, this I know, that's okay. That's pretty innocuous. That's not a big deal. But when you start telling your grandchildren about the sin in their life and how they're going to go to hell, oh, whoa, 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 back off. Oh, don't tell my kids that. I'll tell them that, right? That, that's my job. You don't, you don't overstep your bounds as, as a grandparent. <clears throat> Persecution will come. Verse 18 says, They were put, and that's the apostles, they were put in public jail. So that's the first point. You're going to get persecuted. It's coming. You speak truth boldly, it's coming. Secondly, <clears throat> persecution must lead to persistence. Why must persecution lead to persistence? Let's look at verses 19 through 21. But during the night, an angel of the Lord have opened the gates of the prison, taking them out. He said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. These are the orders to the apostles, right? Well, someone says, well, maybe they weren't necessarily orders to us they were only to the apostles they were supposed to go do that well we don't build doctrine on one verse alone right so back to matthew 10 which is what i was talking about earlier but this is a, a later part in the conversation that jesus was having during the commissioning of the of the disciples first evangelistic uh, outreach event right he's sending them off verse 10 or verse 16 matthew 10 he says behold i am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So he's sending us out. This is for us. Proverbs 1.20 gives us the imperative command. Wisdom cries out a lot, uh, cries out in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. Verse 21, in Proverbs 1. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out, at the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. And this is her message. Verse 22. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? You are bringing truth to the world. And you do so persistently. How are scoffers going to hear if 
no one's going to them. This assumes you're going. You can't have scoffers without the message being preached. Listen to verses 23 and 24 of Proverbs 1. It, it automatically assumes that someone is preaching them the truth. Will you turn away at my reproof? Because I called you and you refused to listen. Who's refusing to listen if no one's telling them the message? Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. All of that assumes a preacher. All of that assumes someone delivering a message. Daniel, Daniel 3 <clears throat> describes a man who knows his mission. He knew the high officials were plotting against him <clears throat> <clears throat> and conspiring against him. They knew that he would not stray from his devotion to God. They set a trap for him, right? When he was going to pray to God, they set a trap for him, yet he persisted and went anyway. He knew that this would be an offense to the king. Yet Daniel knew that he must persist. The prophet Amos reveals to us the reason of our persistence. Amos 3, 7 and 8. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can, put, who can but prophesy? God doesn't do these things without first letting the world know what he's doing. So if he's going to do something, he's going to let everyone know. The Lord is bold and brings his message with truth and power. The message is persistent then. And it's ordered to be persistent. <clears throat> Look at verse 20 again. Go and stand and speak to the people in the temple. The whole message of this life. It didn't say go out there and do a whole bunch of miracles to prove. That's, of course, something that they were empowered to do as the founding fathers of the church. But they were called to go preach the message of this life. And what is the message of this life, right? John says it in his gospel. We say these things so that you would believe in Jesus as the Christ. And, and in believing him, you would have what? Life. That's the message of this life. <clears throat> So persistence is ordered. And then it has to be bold. Not avoiding being bold. Not avoiding the unpleasantness of being bold. It all comes with the territory. Look at the text in verse 21. They went, in, they went to the temple and they began to teach. This kind of persistence is not only ordered, but it's mystifying to the world. Listen to verses 21. Let's, let's continue to read verses 21 to 25. Now they're in the temple and they're preaching at daybreak, right? Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even the senate of the sons of Israel, and then sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who did not come, and I'm sorry, but the officers who came did not find them in, in the prison, and they returned and reported back saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple, temple guard, and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But, some, but someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They didn't run and go hide. Uh, I, I was telling stories yesterday, and, and, and to my shame, I talked about one time when I actually was racing a guy on the highway, and I ran from the cop, which I knew I was going to get away because we were so far away. It was just impossible. It was a literal impossibility that he was ever going to catch us. But in my heart, I knew what I was doing. I was running to hide. That's not what they're doing. By the way, that was a long 
time ago. <laughs> Just so you know. <clears throat> but they're not doing that. This type of behavior then mystifies human logic. They're like, wait, what are you talking about? It's counterintuitive that someone would do that. If they're going to be released, you think they'd be, let's go hide among our sect of believers. And, you know, this is what we talk about with the church hiding. And, and, and I remember Melinda was talking about the other day, uh, the pastor in Canada, they, they, they put the fence around their church. They couldn't have church during COVID. And they were meeting in, in places out in the wilderness just to have church. No, I'm not getting on them for not meeting right next to their building or whatever, but... <clears throat> They persisted. It defies human reasoning that they would be out there doing that. The power of persistence then, under the pressure of persecution, has a lot of P's. But there is power that can be found in the persistence of preaching while under the pressure of persecution to have a few more P's in there. So what am I saying? I mean, the, the disciples, would all of them, they would all go to their graves, right? Under severe, severe persecution. Only John is thought to uh, have died of natural causes <clears throat> while in exile on Patmos. Uh, but it wasn't for lack of them trying to kill them. He, they did try to kill him. He just didn't die. Um, every apostle was murdered under vicious, vicious persecution. But the gospel persisted under the power of their preaching. And as their lives came under pressure and this, from the severe persecution, they were able in large part to, to endure this because of the Holy Spirit. Because they carried the message of God. They carried the message that was born from truth, truth they had witnessed, I mean, no one knowingly dies for a lie. Men will die for a mistake. Men will die for misguided intentions, right? Uh, but men and women, by and large, will not die a violent death for a known lie. But when people hear this message, their reaction is confusing because they don't want to believe it. They can't believe it. If they do, that means they're going to have to change their lives. That means they're going to have to change the direction that they're going. It's not something that they want to do. It's not people. It's not something that people do very often when they're confronted with this truth of God and they're mystified by God. They don't want to change. So persistence has to be ordered by God that we go. The persistence is mystifying to people. The persistence then is also confrontational. Look at verses 26 through 28. The captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. When they had brought them, <clears throat> they stood before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have fill Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring about this man's blood upon us. <coughs> and the apostles are like, that's exactly what we're doing. And that's exactly what we're intending to do. That's the point of the preaching, is to bring that conviction. That's exactly the opposite of what the world tells us we should be teaching. I once had a pastor tell me that uh, and my notes, my, my sermon notes brought condemnation to the listener. That's the point. Without conviction of sin, there's no feeling of repentance. There's no feeling of guilt that leads to the need for the feeling of need for repentance. And God says to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 33, 7. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you will give them the warning from me. Kind of opposite of modern thought. Former SBC President J.D. Greer <clears throat> in September last year had to walk his own words back on the emphasis that the Bible 
was silent or not silent, but it whispered on homosexuality. I'm glad he walked that back. But he says what the Bible whispers about, we whisper and, the, and what the Bible shouts about, we shout. It's convoluted thinking. Matthew 10, Jesus himself says, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Exactly opposite of conventional modern thought. In Jeremiah 26, God tells him, stand in the court, court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship. In the house of the Lord, all the words I commanded you to speak to them. Do not hold back a word. I mean, after a while, you get the feeling that God's trying to tell you something. He's trying to say something. And when you speak the words under the stresses of persecution and an act of obedience, when we don't shut down the under the threat of persecution, the gospel persists under our bold preaching and it goes forward as he intends. You see, we aren't persisting against our persecutors just for the sake of defiance. And some act of flagrant defiance against our persecutors or our government or whatever. We are persisting so his gospel truth goes forward. Verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you are still, you are filling Jerusalem with your teaching and intending to bring this man's blood upon us. Notice, verses, or notice Peter's reaction, verse 29 through 32. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put on a cross, who you put to death by hanging him on a cross, he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Listen, he persists with the necessary condemnation that they needed to bring about the conviction of the heart. You've got to remember that your bringing conviction is the point of your preaching. Why? Almost everyone avoids this. Why? We don't, we don't want to be thought of as, as negative. We don't want to be thought as someone who's, why are, you, why are you always preaching like that? But listen, if you, if you, if you withhold conviction and, and judgment in your preaching, and you're speaking to people, you're withholding the rod of God. That You're withholding the rod which God uses to chasten his people to bring uh, change in their life. Notice Peter's tone. We must obey God rather than men. He's not looking to please men. That's always the issue, isn't it? Look at Galatians when Paul says, am I now trying to please men when he brings this truth? No is the answer. But look at verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus and notice what he says. You put him to death. That's not sugarcoating it. I mean, you imagine evangelizing to someone and saying, you're the reason he's on the cross. We like to, well, we're all sinners and we know no one's perfect. We understand that. They need to feel the conviction sometimes. So sometimes it's important to say the word you. And I know that we don't do that in today's society. I remember working at uh, Dollar General and I, there's a it's a kind of a silly example, but Americans don't like to feel accused of something. We don't. There was a lady who worked there who was from Germany, and she was, uh, you know, very still. I mean, she sounded like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Wait, wait. <laughs> but oh, we loved her, and she loved them. We always joked about it. But anyway, she would she was running the cash register, and and when someone's card, you, know, you put your card in there, it doesn't work correctly, and and you try to figure out how it, you know what's going on, and. It, and she said, well, you're doing it wrong. And they would get so mad. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm doing it right. And I come over and I, and I saw this one day. And I said, no, no, hang on. And I had to sugarcoat the words and go, you know what? Sometimes our computer has problems. And I knew they were doing it wrong. 
They were. I said, just hang on one second and just, I'll, I'll tell you when to put your card in. And so I, you know, we re reset the thing and, and then I say, okay, now I'll go ahead and do it. And then they put their card in. And, okay, now you can press this button. I just led them through, but they didn't want to feel like they were doing something wrong. And they were totally doing it wrong. <laughs> and it's just to say, sometimes, and maybe the way she said it was a little, I mean, there is a way to say you're doing it wrong without getting punched in the face. <laughs> right? So let's, uh, that's, that's the thing. But look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. Cut to the quick. What does that mean? We say it like this, pierce in the heart, right? The Greek word is diaprio. This is to saw. To saw asunder, to be apart. To saw it apart. To saw in the two, to be sawn in half. They're pierced at the deepest level. And this is not like, wow, woof, man, what you said, Peter, really convicted me. I'm going to go think about that and repent. No. It sawed them in half to the point they were enraged and with a murderous intent. And so the next verse says that they intended to kill them. That's how they responded to that message. They were enraged. So this is where we speak the words with obedience, but done with a faith and a trust in the sovereignty of God, right? Because we know that that's coming. We know they're going to be enraged. We know that when we tell our relative, you got to do this. This is the message, right? And we bring that and they think, Feel that conviction. And we're not trying to make them punch us in the face. You know, uh, one my, you know, I talk about MacArthur all the time, and one of the things he says is, I am trying to offend everyone, but not in a way where I'm trying, trying to be offensive, but I'm trying to pierce the heart, trying to bring the, the sense of conviction that God's word brings to the sinner so they understand their error and they can go, and repent. So as we look at all these things, the message comes from a pure church. It comes from the powerful preaching of the message. We endure the persecution and we do it with persistence. And when we do all that, we're going to need a little bit of help, right? It's going to take providential help and that's what we're talking about. That's the last key you would turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis real quick. Genesis 22. Hold your place in Acts. We're not going to go too far. Genesis 22. I almost lost my place in Acts there. So God tells Abraham, right, to sacrifice Isaac. We talked about this morning. Uh, hold your finger there for a second. But remember we talked a little bit ago about the idolatrous worship that Israel got involved in all those years, right? And one of the things they were doing was uh, human sacrifice, right? God had never asked for human sacrifice, yet God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. I mean, the guy's in his 80s or 90s now, the son of promise. This is. The, the, the promise is coming through Isaac. The promise of the coming Messiah is coming through Isaac. And he says, put him on an altar and kill him. In so many words. And God was telling him to do that. And Abraham didn't know what was going on. Because, like I said, God never asked for that before. But, though he didn't know what was going on, he was obedient. He had faith. He had faith that God was going to either provide, right? And he even tells their, their servants as they get ready, they, they, they jump off their donkeys and they're getting ready to walk up the, the hill there where they're going to have the sacrifice. And he tells them, we'll be back. He doesn't know how that's going to happen, 
But he believes God. He believes God when he said that your son's going to be the son of promise. Oh, and by the way, go sacrifice him. I don't know how that's going to work out, but we're going to go find out. Look at verse 7. Isaac spoke to his father and said, My father, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide him for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since I have not withheld, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes, hands still in the air, right? And looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And you've got to imagine the tears are rolling out of his eyes. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And listen to what Abraham calls the place, right? God called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Back to Acts. Verse 34, the teacher of a famous student. We know the famous student, right? Acts 22 tells us about the Apostle Paul. Very famous student of this teacher, this Pharisee. Verse 34, the Pharisee named Gamaliel, the teacher of the law, respected by all the, the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put these men outside for a short time. I got something to say. I don't want them to hear it. That's what Gamaliel is saying. You got to understand the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They did have an agreement, a disagreement over the resurrection. That the Pharisees believed in a resurrection, a resurrection of a, of a body to eternity. And the, the Sadducees did not. And they always make the joke, that's why they're sad, you see. But... No. They're more than that. They're more than that. They, they believe that when you die, you just go out of existence, right? That's, that's the eschatological argument of them. But the Pharisees had the backing of the people. The, the Sadducees had the backing of Rome. They were the ones that were in control of the power that Rome gave them. And they were the, they call, they were called the, most modern scholars call them the, like the, uh, the Supreme Court of Israel. They were the 70. And Gamaliel sees the issue. Because you know, look back to, uh, think back to verse 26. Remember when the, the captain went along to go get them and bring them to be questioned. It says, they brought them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people. And Gamaliel says, I see the rage in your heart, guys. Careful, careful how you step right here. You don't want to cause a revolution with this. Men of Israel, take care that what you propose to do to these men. Verse 35, right? He knows what's in their heart. Listen to verse 36. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him, and he too perished, and all those who followed with him were scattered. So in this present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or action is of, the, is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow him, or else you may even be found fighting against God. So after presenting 
the case of those few failed attempts in their recent past, he calms their fears and on the surface, it appears to be kind of wise, right? Makes sense. It's going to succeed. It's probably of God. But as one commentator put it, this is stupid advice. Why is that stupid? Because not everything that succeeds is of God, is it? Just because it succeeds, it's successful. How about Mormonism? Is that it's succeeding? A couple hundred years? Or a hundred, hundred and some odd years, isn't it? It's close is it, to 200. Yeah. Is it, is it successful? Is it is it of God? Jehovah's Witness? Is it of God? How about all, all the kings and, and we talked about in the beginning? A lot of them had 30, 40 year reigns. You might consider that successful. point is Gamaliel's Gamaliel collect, uh, calculations were not correct. But that's how human eyes look at things, right? We see size as success. We see multitudes as success. We see longevity as success. We see monetary value as success. Uh, you know, churches that have a lot of money and 10 people and they, they could sustain themselves for the next 30 years probably. But the Lord judges differently than we do, doesn't he? He provides in ways where we can't even think of. Gamaliel is known for all of his wisdom, but he became a pawn for God to providentially use him in a way to help his message get out. And they all bought it, right? They all bought it. Verse 40. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. They had to beat them and do something to them, right? They flogged them and ordered, not, and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were considered worthy. James 1, consider it all joy, right? Rejoicing that they had been worthy, considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple... And from house to house, they kept right on preaching Jesus as the Christ. So I want to challenge us this morning. Because the message, the question is, do we really want to bring about change in our community? Do we really want to change this neighborhood? Or are we kind of content with the way things are? Kind of content with the way that we live our lives and the things that we have and the way that Everything goes in and out in our regular day. Remember we talked about in the beginning, the feeling of our nation sliding further and further down the slope and doesn't seem like it's going to stop. A rapidly changing world is becoming increasingly hostile to Christians. And the balance, though, is the full weight of our comfortable lives. Talking to that relative or friend, might have set that delicate balance that we have. And right now we've learned to appreciate that delicate, that delicate balance in our lives. It's not perfect. We might say, it's okay. We're not perfect in our lives, but we're pretty comfortable. I mean, you get used to being in that pot that's getting hotter and hotter, right? You don't even notice. You find yourself compromising further and further on things that you once said that you would never compromise on. It's not many people's lives, but it's ours. We're okay with that. We're okay with our little church. It's okay if we grow. If it's okay if we don't grow. God will sustain us. Really? Are you, are you guys okay with your friends around you that, that don't come to church? Are you okay with them going to hell? Which one of them are you okay with them going to hell? Amen. It's my prayer that we become a people so dedicated to evangelize the lost, that, that God would turn our community upside down, that they would say of us, you know, you guys got to knock off your preaching. It's really getting annoying. You're filling all of Sunny Hills with it, right? That's what they said in the text. You're filling all of Jerusalem with your preaching. Knock it off. I would love it if they said that. If they called us Jesus freaks or fundamentalists or Bible thumpers, as you know, my wife said that she was made fun of in school. 
And we can go rejoice too like the apostles. So let's go ahead and pray.